the lessons with Esco were, were great. I came to him playing French bow. <laughs> and in my second lesson, he was like, so. <laughs> and I knew exactly what was coming. I'd never heard an orchestra play so quietly, but so full. Like it was, it had a very 3D approach to the sound. I had such a great time hearing Alexandra Scott perform at the 2017 ISB convention in Ithaca. She did an amazing recital. I was in the audience, just totally loved it. And it was such a pleasure to follow up with her a few months later and chat with her. And that's what you're hearing today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And my guest today is the wonderful, the talented, the brilliant player and teacher, Alexandra Scott. And Alexandra plays double bass in the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra and is the professor for double bass at the Hochschule for Music in Karlsruhe. She's originally from Somerset, England, and she began her studies at the Yehudi Menuhin School in London with none other than Caroline Emery, who I've had on the podcast recently. Definitely check that out if you haven't. Alexandra and I get into so many great topics. I know you're going to love this conversation. We talk about the journey from the United Kingdom to Germany and what differences she ran into. Very fascinating conversation. Also, switching from French to German bow and all sorts of lessons that Alexandra has learned along the way in terms of practicing, routines, techniques, standing versus sitting, all sorts of great topics. I know you're going to love this conversation. And we've got a few musical excerpts for you here. And you can check out more about Alexandra and listen to her play and just see what she's up to at her website, alexandra-scott.com. We've got some great sponsors for this episode as well. Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and the Bass Violin Shop. More on them later. But let's dive in to our conversation with Alexandra and what it was like going from the UK to Germany. Well, it wasn't like my mother said. My mother said when I got the orchestra, you're going to have to wear a dandel and leather trousers. And I was like, really? Do you think so? <laughs> and I got there and I didn't have to wear a dandel. Thank goodness for that. Um, my, well, my first experience with Germany actually was an Erasmus year in my third year of bachelor. So I studied in London for bachelor. And then we were offered, if we wanted to, to do a third year Erasmus anywhere in the world, which is such an incredible experience, actually. So um, I chose Berlin. And uh, I managed to get a managed to get a um, study place in Hans Eisler. And uh, Esko Leiner, who plays in the Berlin Philharmonic, became my teacher for a year. So that was my first kind of massive culture shock, actually, getting to Berlin. And it was so free and there was so much going on in the city and very sort of artsy kind of feeling. And then studying there, of course, like when I first got to the conservatoire, I remember going up to the base corridor and <laughs> all these boards full of information, which was probably completely normal information. But I just looked at it and I was like, what does it say? I haven't got a clue. All of it in German. And I found the sweetest girl in the world. I said, Entschuldigung, excuse me. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Sprechen Sie English? And she was like, yeah, yeah, I speak English. It's fine. So, <laughs> so she brilliantly, for the next 20 minutes, like translated the entire boards. So I knew exactly what was going on. But I can just remember, I mean, after that, hanging out in those corridors. And I mean, for me, it was suddenly a very international level of, I mean, the students were all very, much more international than what I'd been studying with in London. But funnily enough, I think that might have changed. This is a long time ago now, of course. And not only was it very international, but it was um, the pieces that people were studying were slightly different. The studies that people were studying were different. So whenever you were walking past practice rooms, you'd hear different noises coming out, like completely different from in London somehow, although it's not actually that far away. So that was definitely a big eye-opening moment in coming to Berlin. So it was, it was very exciting. And of course, I mean, the lessons with Esco were, were great. I came to him playing French bow. <laughs> And in my second lesson, he was like, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew exactly what was coming. And uh, I, obviously, I, it, was, it had been on the top of my list, but I was also a bit nervous to ask, like, can I try German bow? And, yeah, my second lesson, he just gave me one of his spare bows, and I took it away and just started to have a go. And I don't know if you play 
Do you play French or German? Well, I play I play French bow, and I'm a very amateur German bow player. It's one of my lo- my long time to do list things that I've just is like get better at German bow. So yeah, uh, f- French bow pretty pretty much for me. But you know exactly what it's like. So when you're playing French bow, you're using like an all sort different sets of muscles here, and then suddenly you suddenly turn around. And all these other muscles come into play. And I can remember when I started to practice, it would sort of be half an hour French boo, and then I'd half an hour German boo, and then it would be so tiring that I have to come back to French. But then at one point, I was like, now listen, you've, it's either or. You know, it's like it's all or nothing, basically. So I signed myself up to um, do a performance class of Beethoven 9, the recitative, and uh, decided I was like, okay, fine. It's gonna be, that's going to be the first performance with German boo. I was incredibly nervous and I felt like half my body was a beginner. Like my left hand was doing absolutely fine, was, you know, strolling around and uh, muscle memory was going absolutely fine. Right hand, I was just an absolute disaster. <laughs> but I continued, I stayed on the, or I got back on the horse because I probably fell off it quite majorly in that performance. There was something else that was extremely special about moving to Munich and Bavaria for Alexandra. The location, I mean, the location within Europe is extraordinary. Um, you can be in Italy in, in two hours, three hours by car. You can be in Switzerland pretty quickly. You can be in Poland. And always, you're so central. If you look at a map of Europe and then you just pinpoint Munich, it's like bang in the middle there. And then um, also the location in respect to the mountains. The mountains are really close. And I mean, this city is so many wonderful musicians have lived here. You know, Strauss lived, uh, Richard Strauss lived like in Garmisch Partenkirchen, which is about an hour out of out of the centre of Munich, and wrote the Alpine Symphony there, and all of these incredible pieces. And you understand. I mean, as soon as you see those Alps, you know exactly why he was writing that music. It's completely programmatic. It's it's amazing. So there's so much history, and also what's amazing about the city is there is so much on offer. It's a tiny city, but it has everything. It has a really wonderful nucleus, and there's a lot of culture going on. It's not only not only music, but there's a massive amount of art. There's some wonderful art galleries and, you know, there were these, these also these artist groups like the Blauer Reiter, the Blue Riders. They formed here in Munich. It's amazing. There was so much going on. And orchestras wise, we have the Bavarian Radio, which is the one I play in. The radio has two orchestras. It has a symphony orchestra and a radio orchestra. And then there's the Munich Philharmonic. Then there's the Bavarian State uh, Orchestra, which plays for the opera. Then there's the Munich Symphonica. There's the Munich Chamber Orchestra. The list goes on. It's amazing. There's a, there's a Baroque orchestra here as well. And what's incredible is if you look in a newspaper and you see the listings for what's on that night, there's you can choose from five to ten different orchestra things, chamber music things, um, solo concerts, um, readings, um, art exhibitions. It's nonstop here. It's really it's really amazing. And um, and what I find even more amazing is that these concert halls are basically sold out. So, I mean, it must mean that every evening, everybody is not at home, <laughs> which is kind of extraordinary, actually, if you think about it. Like, if you would actually count how many people are sitting in a concert hall or in the opera or in a theatre per night, I mean, that's quite a lot of people. That's amazing. There's a, there's a big demand for this kind of culture in the city, and that's... I really hope that never ends. I think that's um, really important for the world. How did Alexandra get connected with the Yehudi Menuhin School and at a young age start studying with Caroline Emery? Here's the story. So, yeah, so this was this was an unreal experience. I mean, the Yehudi Menuhin School is one of the most intense places I have ever been in my entire life. And I was much too young to make the decision myself that I wanted to go there. It was up to my parents and Caroline Emery. And uh, there was this... Um, position free there. Caroline had just started teaching at Menion School. And uh, I was asked to come along for an audition. <laughs> I was nine. So I don't think I'd even got above third position. So I was quite at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, I can even remember what I played for the audition. I played Strolling Along by Lasker. I don't know if you know that piece. I think I'm, it just uh, goes up to D. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is my this is my entrance piece. And amazingly, they, they accepted me, which is really exciting. And then I went there in, the, in, in September and it was like nothing other. So the students were between eight and 18 and there were 48 of them at the time, which is incredible. And violinists, pianists and cellists and then two bass players at the time. And we were definitely, you know, quite exotic and very rare and nobody really knew what to do with us at the beginning. And like, can they do as much practice as us? And do they play scales and 
six and stuff or tens. That probably doesn't work on the booth. But what I did learn from that time, which was incredible, was how to really value your practice time. And when you do have that time in a room alone, you and the instrument, not just to take it for granted and think, yeah, well, I know I've got another six, you know, and tomorrow I'll do this because you never know what's going to happen. And that was, that was amazing. We even had practice supervisors, which of course was essential for kids, I guess. And she would come around, knock on the door and say, how's it going? And that was incredible. And she, I mean, she didn't have the first idea about the bass, but she knew about practice. And if you were slightly in trouble, like, oh, I'm not feeling very motivated or what it was, she'd say, well, you could try this or you could try that. And, and then suddenly you'd be back in, back in it again. She had to check back in 10 minutes to see how you're doing. And that was so cool. And um, probably without realizing it at such a young age, it was um, something which, yeah, made me value practice sessions. And I just had to ask, what were some of Alexander's memories of Caroline Emery as a teacher? Caroline, this, she's a pioneer. She really is. And again, I mean, what a place to land as a student. If you get her as your first teacher, you are so lucky. All the books she's written, all the success she had at such a young age, I mean, she's, she's very patient with kids and very clear, puts things in a very simple way that you can understand it when you're a kid, which, is, which was really, really useful. Probably more than, more than real stories, I just remember probably more feelings, of course, because I was, I was really a kid then. I was seven when I started to play the bass. And that was also, that was also quite, quite interesting because we had these, these mini basses. I don't know if you saw the, bass, the mini basses from like the late 80s, but they were like the machines were kind of, whoa, you kind of couldn't really tune them without the, the whole machine head breaking in half. And <laughs> but it was, it was, yeah, so we all got one of these little mini basses, which was super exciting. And I actually didn't start with her at the menu school. I started with her at the Royal College of Music in the junior department. And what I loved, this is what I remember, actually, what I loved so much was that it wasn't just an individual bass lesson. She also helped us with theoretical sides of music. There was, if I remember correctly, she probably still does this, actually. There were like bass ensemble lessons. So you were straight away from the beginning playing with others, whether they were your level or slightly better or more beginners or whatever. Everyone was playing together. That was so cool. So you could see. You were learning from watching and seeing and, and, and listening and this kind of stuff. But it was, it was amazing with Caroline. And I still have the books that I had then. And when I look back at them, I just think, wow, how patient she was with all of us. It's it's. It's amazing. It was, yeah, very awe-inspiring what she does. Seven is not the youngest, but it's pretty young. Like, how? Why base? What? What's the <laughs> what's the story behind a, a seven-year-old Alexandra? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the story is is pretty simple, and it's, it's a little bit embarrassing. Um, so, my mum was actually teaching violin at Royal College Junior Department, and this the Junior Department takes place every Saturday, mm-hmm. and there's no school. So my mum, probably against her will, had to take me with her. (laughs) And I used to have to sit in her violin lessons. And oh, my goodness. I mean, I was I think I was pretty well behaved. But probably after about two hours, there was quite a lot of leg shaking and like, mom, can I do this and that and the other? And I think she just was getting really annoyed. And um, and then Caroline and her were just having a chat in the hall. And Caroline said that she had a couple of free spaces in her class. And if my mum knew anyone, and of course, as you can imagine, my mum was like, yes, I do, actually. I know someone <laughs> very well. So I was literally immediately sent down to the base rooms and um, given my first uh, first lesson. And I loved it. Straight away, I was like, my God, this is, what a sound. I mean, even on those mini bases, I really thought that, what a sound. It was cool. I felt... I identified with the instrument already at such a young age, which is kind of a bit bizarre, probably a bit nerdy. Next up, we dive into the experience of switching from French bow to German bow. A lot of great takeaways and laughs along the way. I know you're going to love this next segment. And I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Diderio Strings. We are talking this month about Zyx Strings. And here is Lyris Hung, Orchestral Strings Product Manager Diderio, about what goes into those Zyx cores. They fall into mostly what's called a multi-filament, and that just means lots of filaments, <laughs> many filaments. Uh, so it's like a bundle of um, fibers, basically, like plastic fibers. Visually, it resembles something like a bunch of, of doll's hair, you know, like a bunch of very fine pieces of 
thin, thin plastic kind of bundled together. Learn more at ContraBaseConversations.com slash strings. And thank you for sponsoring the podcast, D'Addario. All right, back to our conversation with Alexandra about the switch from French to German bow. What advice would you give them just for making that switch? You know, like someone who's proficient with the French bow, like you were, certainly. What advice, looking back, would you give someone? Um, Number one, stick at it. Okay. Because you will be able to make it eventually. And I think what's really important is to have a sound concept. Suddenly when you change to this, you know, incredible object, you're like, what on the earth is this? The frog is suddenly so big. The sound, of course, is not what you've been used to. So if you have an, a very strong sound concept, concept in your mind, then I think that will help you and make progress much easier. What for you was easier, more challenging? Like I pick up a German bow and it's like, I have this like weirdly good, but uncontrolled spiccato right off the bat that I, I can't really <laughs> use for anything. That's like one for, like what, 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 what was easier or more challenging for you when you made that switch? I can remember a huge challenge was getting to the tip of the bow mm. and then not really knowing what to do with my wrist when I got to the tip. I was like, well, Wow. What, it's like sticking out and it looks very unnatural. This surely can't be healthy. And I thought I was going to have some serious wrist problems. But somehow, with you know perseverance, I managed to get that wrist straight. Thank goodness for that. That was a huge challenge. I remember. Um, what did I find easier? I think actually getting the weight in the string I found much easier. I mean, <laughs> actually what was pretty funny was, so I did this Erasmus year for my third year, but uh, the, the course in London at the time was a four-year course. So I had to come back after the, after the third year and finish my degree. And I remember coming back and I was feeling, you know, like, come on, you know, I've learned German bow now and I'm going to come to my first lesson and kind of show my teacher that I can play German bow. And I remember coming in there and he was like, right, I want to hear Van Hal, I want to hear a CD, I want to hear these excerpts. And I was like, whoa, OK, thank goodness I prepared those. So I was kind of ready-ish, but mentally I felt a bit wobbly. And he said, you know, after this lesson, I will be making a decision whether you can continue with German bow or whether you'll have to go back to French. So the pressure was on. And uh, thank goodness, somehow I managed to convince him. Next up, we dig into how Alexandra got comfortable with the German bow. So in the Erasmus year, I was basically just getting to grips with holding it and not dropping it. I mean, that was quite a major part as well. You know, start to do a little bit of spiccato and then land again. You're like, oh my goodness, I really hope I'm not going to drop this piece of wood on the floor. The year was basically for that. But actually, when I really started to learn the major differences was, um, so after my uh, bachelor course in London, um, I was thinking, what am I going to do now? And um, I'd read or heard about um, the, the, this Carrion Academy in, in Berlin. And I thought, wow, that sounds really amazing. And uh, did the audition and uh, incredibly, luckily, was um, I got accepted, which is was really mind blowing actually, and I couldn't believe it. And it took me the whole summer to carry on not believing it until I got there, and um, still couldn't quite believe what I was doing there. <laughs> Lots of self confidence, um, and was uh, <laughs> handed a ginormous five string. And this is when I really started to see what the differences were, and to really learn what it was, you know, what this German bow was made for. The very first rehearsal was um, Shostakovich, um, first violin concerto was Sarah Chang. And Simon Rattle. And it was a recording, just to, you know, put a little bit more pressure on there. <laughs> so, um, and the, the first, I think it's the first four or eight bars is, is just cellos and basses. And Simon Rattle swooped around to the cellos and basses. And I just thought, oh my God, my heart was somewhere up in my throat. It was beating so, I could I literally thought my death partner must have been able to hear my heart. I was so nervous. And, uh, and then he started and we just all had to play. And I think I'd never heard an orchestra play so quietly but so full, like it was, it had a very 3D um, approach to the sound. And that was something that I then discovered was like what I wanted to learn, how to make a really 3D sound the entire time. So never to be pushing the sound, never to get to that point where you know the string's about to break, as it were, and not actually physically break, but like the sound is going to break. And um, that was something that, um, in the time that I was in the Karen Academy, I definitely tried to just get as much as I could out of the other players who were sitting next to me and just learning by, by watching, actually, by watching and listening to what they were doing and then just directly imitating or at least <laughs> trying to imitate. How do you – now? so, now, I mean, you, you do a lot of teaching, you know, these days. How do you – teach someone to develop that kind of more sophisticated tonal palette, I guess? How do you, how do you teach someone how to, you know, create 3D sound? Well, I think it's, um, at least what I try to think about is, um, where's the sound coming from physically? So 
I think that with a bass, and I, I'm sure it's probably the same with all instruments, but certainly with the bass because it's such a huge instrument, that it's important to use all of your natural body weight if you can. So when I'm starting with a new student or in a masterclass, if it's the right time for that, then I would just, I use the image of a tree quite a lot. And um, to try to think of our bodies as being like a tree and our feet are like the base of the tree. And you have to try to imagine that you have these roots coming out of the soles of your feet. So you're very grounded, very grounded. That doesn't mean to say that you're fixed completely on the floor and that all your legs and hips and everything are completely stiff. Absolutely not at all. Because like trees, when the wind blows, they move a lot and they're very, very flexible, although they're very strong. And that's the image that I tried to give at the beginning. And then the very, I think another very important thing is to always have the feeling that your arms are incredibly heavy, always. And you're never, ever holding onto your shoulders, that your shoulders are just like enormous pendulums coming out of the shoulder socket. And I like to play a small little game. And I think most most teachers do this, but just to find the natural weight of the arm. So with the bow arms, you hold up, you get the student to hold up their right arm at a horizontal level and you ask them if you can hold their arm and they should just give you the entire weight. And then you tell them at one point you're going to let go. And the idea is that they really feel this weight. And we do that a couple of times, do this a couple of times. And then so you can really like understand what that really feels like and then put the bow in the hand. And try from this horizontal position to come down, come down gently, 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 still feeling this incredible weight in the arm until you get onto the string. And then to feel like almost like you have your entire body weight on the string, but without pushing, just basically sleeping. Also, if I take, for example, if I take a bit of time off over the summer, for example, a couple of weeks off, when I come back to the base, that's one of the first things that I try to do. So I stand with the base, I, I stand to play stand with the base in front of a mirror and give myself an entire body scan. So not only a visual scan into the mirror, but also like a mental scan where I think of my soles of my feet, what they're doing, going up my knees, hips, uh, torso, and then into the shoulders, and then gradually lifting slowly, slowly, slowly. And it's super basic. But I think it's really important that you don't just like jump into a scale or, or bodicini concerto, that you really just give yourself that chance to come back to basics. And I think that helps so much. You know, it's like the blueprint. You know, it's got to be really strong. When you're doing that sort of scan, are you, are you trying to then release as you go up the body? Or are you just like, is it more like an awareness thing? Just like awareness of my legs, you know, hips, torso? What, what are you thinking about? Awareness, absolutely. But release is also incredibly okay. important to be aware if anything's being held on to. So like if you've got some kind of, we often don't breathe deep enough as well, which I find also massively affects your sound. If you're, if you're kind of breathing from the top of your chest and not really breathing into your stomach, it can be a kind of feeble sound or a really fat 3D sound. And I think that the breathing helps a lot. Use everything we have. <laughs> is, is that something you do like on a regular basis, like before a recital or before uh, uh, solo passage in orchestra? Absolutely. Is it? Okay. Absolutely. The entire time. I mean, if you, if you have, of course, there's the long version and the short version, I suppose, for a, before a, a difficult passage in the orchestra, I might have about two seconds to think, okay, relax your knees. Is your foot up? No, okay, put it down. Just breathe a little bit. Okay, now go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah i mean ideally of course in every practice session i want to do that it might take 10 seconds and if i have enough time it might take five minutes and you, it's, it's a bit like meditating i guess it just has something you get really in the zone we round out today's episode with all sorts of advice we dig into topics like technical practice more about sound even about simon rattle and what makes him inspiring and special as a conductor i know you're going to love this and i want to give a shout out to our final sponsors upton bass string instrument company so great to have upton on board and here is lucia torino of the devil makes three the great punk bluegrass traditional band about her experiences with Upton. I have the Upton travel base. A friend of mine who was in a band called Brown Bird, I think she'd had some work done on her base and she had a pickup that she got from Upton and she knew one of the guys who worked down in the um, factory in, in Mystic. Also calling it a factory is really charming because it's really just a barn that smells amazing with right. lots of cool bases and, and very sweet men. Chris Wood, he had two Chadwick bases with him and so I like got my courage up and sort of sidled over to him at one point. and was like, I need a bass. What should I get? <laughs> and I talked about Chadwick and about Upton. And he was like, honestly, I'd go with the Upton. Learn more about them at UptonBass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. 
Also, thank you to the Bass Violin Shop for providing the hosting for Contrabass Conversations. There are a lot of costs that go on with putting on a show like this, getting out to the world. So thank you guys for sponsoring the podcast and helping out with those hosting costs. Learn more about them at BassViolinShop.com. All right, back to our final part of our conversation with Alexandra Scott, all about Simon Rattle preparation and lessons learned along her journey. I'd love to know what else you do like in a typical practice session or maybe just in a, in a typical routine. Like I was just interviewing Gary Peacock, who's in almost well into his 80s at this point. Keith Jarrett's bass player, you know, played with so many people. And he has just this amazing daily routine, you know, wakes up and he meditates for, I think, 45 minutes and then has a, like a little coffee and a little yogurt and then goes to the bass <laughs> for an hour. And he says he's been doing that for... 50 years plus, you know, so like, do you have a daily, a daily approach to the, and I, I think we all have something kind of like that if we're on tour, maybe it gets messed up or whatever, yeah. but do you have like a daily routine with the instrument or kind of just in general? Absolutely. I mean, you're right. It depends on where we are. So if we're on tour or if I'm teaching a lot or if I'm at home and I'm, or if I'm on holiday, of course, then I could really immerse myself and take the bass and then spend hours just like analyzing the best way to do a warm up and this kind of stuff. And then hopefully give some of those ideas onto the students. That's like an ideal world. But <laughs> let's face it, <laughs> um, if I am getting an hour and a half in a day, I am the happiest person in the world, actually, because it can sometimes be quite difficult to get that in. And thankfully, I'm very um, grateful that I have a lot of time to practice when I was a student. And I learned from a very young age how important practice is. That doesn't necessarily mean I was very good at it, but I saw it from a very young age. Technically, do you have some exercises you like to have people do? Shifting drills, different ways of practicing scales, certain etudes. Um, yeah. Maybe thinking about sound, like just developing. You know that. What What do you What do you like to have people work on? Well, I think actually, I mean, of course, bow is an incredibly important part, right, <laughs> of right. Of, our, of playing the bass. I think what you need to develop as a student is to be able to know how to use your bow. I mean, that sounds pretty basic, but let me go into a bit more depth. That you know that there are different parts of the bow. And what, actually going back to what I said earlier about my wrist not being able to get straight when I got to the tip, even for people who've started with German bow, you often find that they don't go into the top eighth of the bow. They just, they just don't get out there somehow. And that is such a magical part of the bow. For the moment, I do have a just a couple of exercises that I've just thrown together and um, written sounds a bit over the top, but they are somewhere written on manuscript paper. And it's just basics. It's just about bow division, like using the bottom quarter, the middle quarter, the top middle, and the top. So that you, you're really aware of the, different, the four different parts of the bow. And then to play scales in those different parts of the bow, whether using a quarter of a bow, half a bow, three quarters, or a whole bow, that you're aware of it. And... Um, I suppose that's an essential part. <laughs> we do actually, in Karlsruhe, where I teach, we have termly, or semesterly, as they call them in Germany, a, a Tornleiter test, which is a scales test. And all the students are aware that at the end of every term, there's a scales test. And it's a random scales test. And every scale is three, oct three octaves and has uh, different rhythms. And um, it can be a whole tone scale or a chromatic scale or a dominant seven, this kind of stuff. So scales are a really important part of the of the student's life in classroom. Alexandra and I talk about some of the benefits of playing standing up. You can dance with the instrument and you can get around to the E string much easier and then up to the G string much easier. I, yeah, I suppose that kind of flexibility has a, is a big plus for standing. But um, I mean, the, and you know, the, the, the cons, of course, are also equally as big. Shifting becomes an absolute nightmare at the beginning. You just feel like you're going to drop it the entire time. So working out that balance and how to stand and which part of your hip or your tummy or whatever it is is actually touching the base is an incredibly important part of learning to stand, I think. Yeah, we try to answer them. And I think, but, uh, you know, a lot of the answers just come from just trying and trying and trying and finding your way, actually. Alexander's had the opportunity to work with the great Simon Rattle many times, both in the Bavarian Radio Orchestra and then earlier when she was studying in Berlin. Here are a few of her thoughts about what makes Simon Rattle special as a conductor. What do you think it is about him that makes him stand out as a conductor, like whether in rehearsal or in performance? I think I can probably answer that much better from being in the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra because he conducts us, um, I think, roughly every season or, or once every two years, something like that. Um, and 
each of those performances has been really incredible. His energy, everyone is on the edge of their seat from the first moment of the rehearsal till the last bar of the concert. And they want to learn and they want to do what he says because it's he's so passionate about what he says. And this is definitely a week where everyone wants to play in, in the brain radio. When I, if I can speak about it from a very personal point of view, I definitely feel that when he's conducting, it's like, it's like chamber music. You're not just the bass group. It's each person counts and you've all got to be giving the energy. And that's what he wants. And he kind of demands that from you and everyone does it. I mean, that's really, it's a, they're amazing weeks. You know, there's no one sitting back in their chair and thinking, I wonder where the next break's going to be. And actually I'm desperate for a coffee. Everyone's like, oh my God, is it lunchtime already? It's, it's kind of, it's exactly the kind of music making that you want to have week to week. You can pick the age, but like whether it's 17 year old Alexandra or 22, you know, just leaving Karyan Academy or at whatever point. But what advice would you give? And you're so early in your career still, you probably have a different answer in 20 years. But, but you Very know, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> preparation really, I cannot, and it's, it's almost like my mantra actually for myself nowadays um, is you can never be overprepared. You really can't. I mean, you just, like, even if it's something as ridiculous as every day as waking up in the morning saying, right, what have I got to achieve today? What do I need to get done? Like in my practice session, in the orchestral rehearsal, when I'm teaching so-and-so in the afternoon, or if you're a student and you're like, you know, you've got three hours practice in the morning and then you've got a lesson and then you've got, I don't know, like a chamber music rehearsal. Like, what do you want to achieve? Are you prepared for that? And just to just like process it in your mind, but rather than just going like a bull in a china shop, I think that is definitely something I would have told myself when I was 17 or 18. Yeah, it just makes everything so much easier, doesn't it? Alexandra, thank you so much for chatting. It was so much fun to connect with you. And folks, definitely check out her website, alexandra-scott.com for more on what she's up to. And I have so much fun meeting people like Alexandra and seeing her perform and then being able to follow up with questions and curiosities that I have and that I know others have as well. So it was so fun to dig into these topics. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you're new to the podcast, might I suggest you go back and listen to my interview with Caroline Emery from earlier this year. You can go to ContraBaseConversations.com slash Caroline Emery, or if you have our app, did you know we have an app? It's free, and you should definitely get it. It's a great way to search through the archives. You can just type Caroline Emery into that, and it'll pop right up. And if you have the app, or you go to our site, either way, but it works great on the app, and you type any topic, be it auditioning, life overseas, air travel, jazz, anything like that, any person's name, that episode will pop right up. You can download it. You can star it. There are extra features, and it's a great way to connect with the podcast. And I would love to have you connect with me. You can email me, feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. Let me know any ideas you have for the show, anything you're enjoying about the show, what you'd like to hear more of, that sort of thing. That would be great. And if you want to help this show grow, and I hope you do, I, I'm so thankful that you're listening the best thing you could do is to share this episode with a friend, with a colleague, with a student, with your mom, if you want. It doesn't matter. Share it out. We are on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Those are great places to connect. You can share those links. Within the app, you can share this episode. On our website, you can share this episode. That does more than anything to help spread the word about the show. I'm so thankful you listened. So great to have you here. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Thank you.